Greg is a barn and house historian. He's a consultant and owner of Past Perspectives and Eastern Barn Consultants, which I happen to know they have a very nice newsletter if you're interested in receiving that newsletter. Uh, it's a historic and cultural resource company. He has specialized in house and barn architecture of Holland, Dutch, and Pennsylvania, Swiss German cultural areas that include more than 8,000 vernacular houses and barns. Uh, he has authored more than 260 articles on architecture and is co-authored of two books, the second edition of The New World Dutch Barn and Stone Houses, Traditional Homes of Pennsylvania's, of Pennsylvania's Bucks County and Brandywine Valley, Valley. I think you spoke to that the last time you were here. Okay, he has also led more than 95 house and barn tours and given more than 230 lectures on architecture in the past 25 plus years. He won the Alice P. Kenny Memorial Award and the Alan G. Noble Book Award issued by the Pioneer American Society. He also has a barn news and events newsletter. So, the Bucks County, uh, barns of Bucks County, Pennsylvania, we're, we're going to be looking at both German barns and English barns. And probably that was the only type of barn that was built after a certain length of time. You'll see this. Um, in more detail in a little bit. Now I am, the rule of, of giving PowerPoint presentations is not to read the screen, but I'm gonna do that. It's not that I don't know the material, it's just that I wanna follow this and you can read it and everybody's happy, I guess. So there's German barns, there's Schweitzer barns and standard barns. There's two different types of German barns, okay? And I'll explain what they are. Um, English barns, English Lake District barns. Okay, the above barns are all two level structures. I'm just orienting you now in the very beginning. In addition, their one level ground barns are also built in the county. They're both English based and German based. And I'm only saying that because the Germans built them and then the English built them. But what they really were, as far as distinguishing their qualities or characteristics, I really don't even know to this day. So it's just one of those things, all right? Okay, the earliest barns in Bucks County. Now who, <coughs> pardon me, has heard of New Sweden? Anybody? You, you, okay, a few people. New Sweden was the area, uh, I think it was originally based in Newcastle. I may be wrong about that, Wilmington, Newcastle area in Delaware. And the Swedes came there and the Finns came there. And it may be just the Swedes were there for the very first time and then this, the Finns came there in a year or two. Anybody wants to, you know, add to that or correct it or you know, improve upon it is perfectly welcome. But they came there in about 1638 and they very, very, very likely built log structures and they were probably of a one-story unbanked nature and that's the way they were built. We have very, very, very little knowledge of the very first barns that were built in, uh, in Pennsylvania, what, the area what later became Pennsylvania. And so the first barns were probably built somewhere in the 1640 to 1670 era. They were probably more closely uh, built uh, in the 1640s or so. Okay, these, fils these first built barns may well have been the result of the settlement of the Swedes, as I just said. The barns were very likely of law construction. We went over that. The very earliest, and, and the next slide really gets into some of the details, the very first uh, very positive indication of a barn being built was from a guy named Ambrose Barcroft. I hope I have that name right. And what he did is send a letter to his dad. This is in the 1725 to 1723 era, okay? We say 1722 slash 23 because that was the old calendar way. The new calendar way, if you want to call it new, was in 1752, okay? This is just shy of 300 years ago, so we have that document that says that. Now, Barcroft wrote a letter to his father in England about the trials and tribulations he was experiencing in America. He said that the building of a barn of four bays, it would, which is interesting for that early a barn for four bays, usually there are three bays, if you even get any reference to a really early barn like that. It would cost me near 30 pounds to let out. But the man I just mentioned is something of a carpenter, and I think the assistance of a good workman a few days at setting up the frame, he'll do the work. The clapboard and shingle I have bespoke and is already paid with goods that I have sold. 
So he tells the prop, basically the whole, the whole gamut there. The presence of the words clapboard and shingle is virtual proof that the barn was frame built as opposed to log built and stone built and maybe adobe built. Well, there weren't too many of those. And of course, the word frame. You have to be very careful when you interpret words of documents of 250 to 300 years ago. Yes, the fact that on this homestead, there was also a record of a log house being built. Log construction. Who's ever seen a log house or a log barn? Yeah, okay, about half of you, roughly. Okay. Any of those outside of Bucks County? You? you did you see yours outside of Bucks County? No? In Bucks County. Yeah, okay. A barn or a house? House. Yeah, probably. Because the, the log barns in Bucks County now is very rare. Okay. In any event, there was a log house at that home, uh, at that same homestead. So there was a log, there was a frame barn and a log house. And the general consensus of houses being built, at, at, especially at an early time, were either they're both log or both stone or that kind of thing. So that that is a real aberration, as far as I can tell. All right. Well, do you know the period that the log and stone, the log houses started in? Boy, that's a tough one. When it ended? Where it, when it ended? Yeah. Probably sometime. I mean, it could have been after the Civil War, but it could have been, you know, 18, probably into the 18, certainly the 18, almost certainly in the 1840s, but maybe the 1850s into the 1860s. I mean, I know of, I know of a log Schweitzer, a log and frame Schweitzer that was built 1856 in Lebanon County. That was, a, that, that was really extraordinary. Anybody recognize that barn at all? Yeah. Who said yes? yes. You I said yes. The the, yeah, um, you've only passed it 15,000 times, right? It's you ever been in it? Are. You ever been in it? Uh, not the barn itself, no. <laughs> okay. I've seen it from the outside. I'm sorry? I've seen it from the outside. It's been hit by cars, by all oh, kinds yeah. of vehicles. <laughs> it's burned on the inside, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. And the structure on the inside is all not original, okay? It's right along Route 32. What would you say, two or three miles south of New Hope or, yeah. or thereabout? Yeah, yeah. That barn I've known for a very long time. Okay, that's a side view. Now, the thing that's really interesting that might mitigate against it being called a 18th century barn is because the stone, well, there's a few things going on here. The stone only goes up to the eave level. It doesn't go all the way up to the peak. The earlier Schweitzers, the earlier standard barns, stone almost always goes up to the peak. So whether, assuming that that's original, it's an aberration. I was told many years ago that that was an early 17, 1702, 1703, 1704 uh, structure. Also, you can see that the roof line is not symmetrical. Look at how far it comes down on the one side. That's a salt box. Whether that's original or not, I have no idea whether it is or it isn't. So what, what is the date? If you don't have any stuff, if you don't have any timbers on the inside, you can't dendro date it or core date it to, to make a study out of it. So, you know, who knows what the, but it's supposed to be one of the earliest barn, actually in the, in the state. Here's a back view. This is the, on the left-hand side is the salt box area. And you see the, um, the wagon doors right there. Mm -hmm. And then those, Slits. Anybody knows what those slits? They're also called balustradia. Anybody know what they are for? Air ventilation. It was it was for air ventilation. Yeah. yeah. What's odd about that is that they're at different levels. Usually they're two and like one and one, or two and two. On the end walls, they can be two over three over four over five. Are they also used for light or no? I'm sorry, yeah, you get light yeah, you get a little bit of light, but it's splayed. You see, it's not just a slit like that. On the inside, it goes like it goes like that. So it can be as much as 18. Yes, it can be as much as about 18 inches wide on the inside. Yeah. And and they're they're ancient. They come from Europe, and they could come from someplace else. This is a barn about, I don't know, two or three miles north of Doylestown, and we can't talk about this too much. I hope the owner's not here. Um, this took a little bit clandestinely. Anyway, on the end wall of the barn, um, I'm sorry. Here, oh boy, I can't, all right, so on the left, you have 
a roof peak, of course, and you got that window. And then below that, there are two date stones. One is from the 1750s, I believe, and the other one is from the 1820s. So the barn was rebuilt. It's actually in two sections. You can't see it there. And I wish I could, I wish to heck I could have gotten inside, but I didn't. But anyway, that's got to be, that's 1756 for a barn. And it probably did come from a barn. It's one of the earliest that I know of in Southeast Pennsylvania, actually. I apologize for this barn. I put this up, you know, I made it as one of the slides, but I don't think, I don't think it's in Bucks County. I think it's in Montgomery County but it's a ground barn. Now we have an unbanked, in other words, there's no bank leading to either of the wagon doors on either side. So it's a one level unbanked ground barn, okay? If you look at the, if you look at the, the bottom part, that white painted area, that's stone of course, and above that is frame. So it could have been, and I never got into this barn, it could have been stone and log or stone and frame, but this is in Montgomery County and actually, this is not stone at all. This is not, I'm sorry. This is changed, okay? It was changed from stone to concrete block. And there's no way that the concrete block, of course, is original. Okay, so we have one example of a ground barn. Now, there's three, there's three forms of barns in, let's limit ourselves to southeast Pennsylvania. There's a one-level ground barn that's unbanked. There's a two-level bank barn of two types, okay? And then there's a third one that I think I have one or two shots of, and that is a double decker, where you have an upper, upper, upper deck or upper floor, then a sink mow with grain compartment bins, and below that, a stable area. Sorry. Okay, this, so this is, yeah, this is the end wall. Right there, just below the roof peak on the end wall, is a thing called a schwelmelok, and that means owl or swallow hole. Okay, and that's to check the vermin population, supposedly, okay? There's a lot of tradition about that. They have them in Europe, probably elsewhere. You have the two cu the cutouts on, on the east and the west side, and then the north and the south side. I've wanted one of those things for years, and no one hasn't been able to locate one for me. So if anyone has an extra one. Okay, Schweitzer Barnes. Now that ground barn section was very short. That's the first form, okay? Now we get into the two-level bank barn. And the Schweitzer barn was first produced or first erected very likely in Lancaster County. Everybody, if there's any county in North America that is known for their barns, it's probably Lancaster County. So you're shaking your head. Oh, I'm out there all the time, so I see a lot of barns. You see that, you're there all the time. Yeah, my husband has a house out there. We go. Oh, where? Um, more like Cochranville. Cochranville. <laughs> okay, I've heard of it. I'm not sure I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. A lot of the barns there. There's tremendous. With my not even trying to find these barns, I found about 135 or 40 by now. And I just go down any, almost any road. That's not true. But, I, you know, I kind of look for them, but not really. They kind of just bump into you. So Schweitzer Barnes, they had origins in the eastern cantons of Switzerland. But anyway, what makes a barn a Schweitzer? It's a two-level bank structure. It has a front four-bay area as a separate appendage, which we'll see in a little bit. This appendage is a German-based cantilevered four-bay. We'll see what cantilevered means in, in, in relation to a barn. Due to front appendages, Schweitzers have asymmetrical roof lines. You can see on this, on this uh, barn cover, uh, the barn there has a symmetrical roof line, okay? It's even, the roof line is even on each side, but in Schweitzer's, that's not the case. Only a very few Schweitzer's have been identified in Bucks County, and that is true. Okay, that's one of them. Way up in uh, Springfield Township, again, we have a few things here. We have only stone to the eaves level. Mm -hmm. And you have the uh, front four bay. Oh, and the uh, stone is not to the peak; it's to the eaves level. If I didn't say that before, if that didn't, ha if that did have stone to the eaves level, or stone to the peak, I'm sorry, that I would probably have given that barn, oh, maybe uh, 10, uh, 20 years before that, maybe 1790 or so. Okay. So, and that has this asymmetrical roof line, which Schweitzer's always have. This is another one. This is a really cool barn. This is actually dated. This barn is dated 1800. If you look at the end wall up just below the peak, it says PH. Uh, 
and I thought it was Peter Hager, it's actually Philip Hager. It's right off of Quarry Road, if anybody wants to wander up there. Um, it's on the left-hand side, you have to go around and through and over and all that. But it's a small barn, it's only three days, but it's a really nice one. The interesting thing about this, if you look at the front forebay, which is pretty short, look at how the end wall of the short forebay is recessed in. It's not flush with the end wall. You see that? There are a number of those barns, but they're far outshined by the other ones that have a forebay that's, uh, that's flush on the end. Okay. So that's, that's, that's an interesting moment. There's just a split door, there's a stable wall door that uh, is original, that's about a 220 year old uh, door. There's so many details here that I could get into. Schweizers were not just built in, uh, of course, uh, Pennsylvania. A number of them were built in Maryland. There was probably hundreds of them. Uh, now there's not a whole lot, but there's still several of them, a number of them, probably upwards of 15, and tw 15 to 20. The reason that I'm saying that's 1800 is that the roof line is fairly steep. If you had a really steep roof line, like the Isaac Long Barn in uh, Lancaster County, which was built the first part in 1756, and the addition after the barn became stylized had a very steep roof. Okay, so that's probably built around 1800. Look at how. Uh, short that four bay is in the front and it does create the asymmetrical roof line and that you can ignore as far as the original construction that rear shed in the back. So that's uh, Maryland. This is a log, a double, we won't go in the barn, but this is a double log crib Schweitzer and it is in northern um, West Virginia and is very close to the Potomac River. So that was that was neat. It has a, a unique roof structure for a barn that, as far as we know, in West Virginia, maybe in a few houses, but not not the barn, as far as we know. Okay, standard barn. So we're going to wander into the standard barn area of the world. What makes a standard barn? A standard barn is a two-level structure, just like the Schweitzer, and it is banked at the rear. Same thing, but it has a symmetrical roof line. In a Schweitzer, the framing. The frame of, or the bends, the, the transverse framing units, don't go into the forebay. Here, in a standard barn, they do. It has a recessed stable wall, try to remember that. Basement ceiling, beams, or joists extend beyond the stable wall, and are cantilevered. This is what makes a forebay barn, and it is strictly German-based, for sure. It's certainly not English. Another very, very important tidbit, there are no other barn types, and I've said this before, there's no other barn type in all of Pennsylvania that is more prevalent in the entire state. It was extremely efficient means of storing farm crops and stabling farm animals. These Schweitzer barns were really almost uh, medieval-like. Very low side walls, and, it just ha and same thing with Dutch American, uh, Holland Dutch barns in New York State, New Jersey, it was that way. But the critical time was 1820, 18, 1810, 1820, when the Industrial Revolution took over. Okay, and that changed just about everything. The earliest remaining standard barn anywhere is the dated 1792 barn, to the different barn in Chester County. And that barn is in English territory. So figure that out. Now that's relative to the population that we have now of barns. So it's not in a German area. What I'm really getting at, and it's in the book, is that actually, and I said before, that Schweitzer barns went into standard barns, okay? But that may not be exactly true. That's the common wisdom that's thrown about. But it could have evolved from an English Lake District barn. And we'll see about that in a little bit. We have a number of, we also have a number of 1800 to 1810 era standard barns and also 1810 to 1820. So what I'm saying is that they, by the 18, by the first decade of the 19th century, and, the, and the, certainly by the second uh, decade, they really started to be built. And they're really churning out. And people that anticipated, not so much anticipated, but knew the Industrial Revolution, and they had to compete with farmers out in the Midwest. They were producing very cheap foodstuffs out there, and where are they going to, and don't forget, a lot of this food, a lot of these foodstuffs went to Philadelphia. So you have to produce, you have, they had to compete. We have to compete now with each other, and they competed then. So it's, no, it's really no fundamental difference there. So now we have a stone to the eaves level standard barn. This one is circa 1850 on Ridge Road. 
and West Rock Hill Township. I usually don't give speci real specific uh, era, de uh, locations like that, but this one I did for whatever reason. It's probably an 1850 barn, give or take, stone to the eaves level, and it is, these barns were probably built from about 1840 to 1860. The earlier you go, the, the, the more frequent you see barns built to the stone, to the peak. Was there a benefit, or was that just a style? Was there a benefit? Well, it's, it's so certainly a style. I mean, it's, it's, cer it's certainly a style, but it was probably cheaper. I mean, the higher you went on an end wall, you know, you'd have to uh, uh, erect all the scaffolding and everything, you know, and, uh, and wood was becoming cheaper. Sawmills be came in and that kind of thing. You know, they, they thought cheap just like we did, but they thought cheap according to their own consciousness. That's the difference. If you don't think anything else can be done, or if you're committed to the old traditions, then why make it any different? Oh, yeah. So here we see below the four. Now, this is what's so critical about a four bay barn. So we have the right here on the lower left, right here where that netting is. Okay, that's the stable wall. And above that, you have ceiling joists that run back into the basement. So they go from the back rear wall over the stable wall and cantilever out. That's where that word uh, that I used before. And it cantilevers out anywhere between usually four to five feet. Okay, that's what makes the barn a four-bay barn. Yeah, this is the basement of that particular barn. So we have to have support. We have to have a floor above there for the second loft level, or the second level, which is the loft. And so how do we support that? We support a summer beam, which is that longitudinal beam, by posts. And usually there's one or two summer beams in a barn basement if it's banked, okay, not a ground barn. There are, bar there are some barns, there are a few barns that have as many as three or four summer beams. There's a barn out in Franklin, uh, Franklin County that has four. It's only 120 feet long and by 60 feet, six inches. Why would I know that so precisely? 60 feet, six inches. Anybody know? Baseball. Baseball. Animal. Okay, so here we have the posts, the longitudinal uh, summer beam, the joists up above, they go from the back wall, as I said, all the way to the front wall, and then the planks up above. Okay, this is a shot of the stable wall door, original. I've never yet found, a, in all the barns that I've been able to visit, I've never once seen an upper door half that actually had an original cutout for a window. I've never once seen that. So when did they come in? Probably about 18. 80, 90, something like that. As the years progressed, there was more light, they wanted more light in both their houses and their barns. And I think that's, I really think that that's a carryover from medieval times, okay? But that's a whole other topic, that really is. The other part of this photo that's interesting is the stone uh, formation right there. So the stone end wall comes out and then you have a front part and it forms an L formation, and that's called a pile wreck, and that's where I got that word there. It means pier corner. It means pier corner. And it was just simply for extra support on the end wall. And there's all there's thousands of barns that have pile wrecks. They, they're even in New Jersey. <coughs> okay, so this is the rear side of a three-bay bank barn leading up to the wagon bays. Um, there's two things about bank barns. Either you excavate the ground, or that's where the basement is going to go, or you build it into a, uh, into a bank, and that in effect creates, well, creates the bank. And that's what fills the criteria for a, for a, a two-level bank barn. Okay? I've been doing a lot, a lot of work in the last nine or 10 years on barn stars and hex signs and all kinds of symbols. Okay, this is a, this is at the uh, Bedminster. Oh yes, I know where that is, but I shouldn't tell you where it is. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's, it's off of Route 113. <laughs> um, this is a, a six-pointed rosette. Rosettes are the most common symbol in the world. 
There's nothing that beats that. Since I've been doing a lot of this heavy research in the last, well, for about nine or 10 years, and, I, and I'd, I'd done a number of things before that, um, I see again and again and again things going back hundreds and hundreds of years. It really goes back, I think, to about 1700 BC. Wow. So that's a long, long time. Okay, and this is just a small outbuilding. Was it for decoration or to ward away evil? That's another topic. Yeah. A close up, right? Those are much harder. Really well done ones are much harder to do than you might think. Here is a barn, Springfield Township, okay? And that stable wall there that you see below the red siding is not original. That came out. And a lot of the um, sanitary laws of of the state changed a lot of barns, and don't we love them for doing that? But some of them didn't do that. I know a guy in Montgomery County, the uh, local township guy or county guy came by, and he says, we want you to change your barn, and it has to be sanitary and everything. You've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to do the other thing. And he said, no thanks. Now get off my property. I don't know if he said that. <laughs> but it never changed, and that, bar and that was back in the 30s or something like that. His father told him that. And uh, the barn still has the original stable wall. So this is, uh, this is a pretty well known spot up there. You have a barn building on the right hand side and on the left hand side, the main barn is right there. This is Stone to the Peak. It was probably built around 1820 to 30 possibly. But the decoration, <coughs> pardon me, on, on the wall up there is called a swirling swastika or swirling uh, I'm sorry, whirling swastika. Okay, that goes back many, many, many hundreds of years. And it really is basically in uh, south, I'm sorry, well, it's in southeast Pennsylvania, but it's not far from the Lehigh Valley. There's probably upwards originally of maybe 200 barns that had them. Now there's several dozen. They did exist. And the, what we do know of a barn in Berks County, Sinking Spring, that has a date stone. It's not a German barn either, right? not that I can see. Anyway, it has, a, it has a date stone on it that was allowed to erode for over 50 years, and now you can hardly see it, but fortunately, pictures of it were taken. And it's 1802, and it had a swirling swastika at the top of it. So we've lost a lot, a lot of things in the last 100 years, and even before that. Now, this is a real thrill for me. I was just starting out for a few years and this is in Doylestown at the Ag School. Anybody recognize that barn yes, at all? Yes. Do you? Well, that's a stone to the peak barn, but it doesn't have any real wall, end wall uh, openings, okay? So I gave this barn probably a date of about 1840, okay? You have a, a rear shed, but no, you can see the symmetrical nature of the, uh, of the standard barn part, but this is a special. This is really special. I was flabbergasted when I saw this. See that? See that construction? Now let me let me proceed to the next one. That's a oops, that's a close-up. That's a yeah, a closer up shot. Okay. Now this timber right here is arched. It's only about eight to ten feet in back of the front wall of the barn. So you'd have the wagon door here and wagon doors there, and you'd drive in and unload the uh, farm crop farm crops. There were there were sapling poles from the from the uh, anchor light beam. I'll explain that in a minute. Back to the front wall, and it created extra mouth space. Okay, and that's what that was for. And at this point, I've probably discovered about eight, or either discovered or been told about eight, eight to ten of these barns, and they're generally in the Makefield Township area. Okay, the special thing about this, let me, let me go, let me do this, is that. See the extended tenon? Everybody hip on mortise and tenon joinery? Mm -hmm. The tenon extends out beyond the post, it's wedged, and all this timbering is oak. Rarely chestnut in our area. There could be some exceptions for sure. My understanding is that once you get into southern Lancaster County and down into Maryland, and maybe certain areas west of the Susquehanna River in that area, like southern York County and maybe Adams County, there's a lot more chestnut, a lot more. Okay, but that's very rare. Now that's an anchor-like beam construction. 
Yeah, a closer up view of the longitudinal an an anchor beam like timber with extended wedge tenon at the ends, okay? That's what that has. This is a very distinctive one. So whether they picked this up from the Holland Dutch people, and that's where, I'm not gonna say that was the origin because they, they may have wanted this uh, construction, basic construction of a tie beam and they extended it out and wedged it and all that. The real point of this is that we have, we have a means when you take photographs of any barn, especially a vernacular barn prior to about 1880 or 1890, we have a record of the decisions that they made. Things went through their mind, obviously, just like things go through our minds. And this is a record of the decisions that they made in their mind. And that's why when you see a lot of diversity in the same basic things, you have thousands upon thousands of standard barns, but they're different. They have, you know, your, your signature is different than your signature and that kind of thing. So this is one of the things that I try to emphasize when I give talks, that these are really records of the decisions that they made. Now here's another interesting feature that, you know, you have to look at a number of barns to, to gain an insight into this. So you have this anchor beam, the cross tie, come over, it enters the post, but look at it, it's basically flush at the top, mm. and then it's angled off. That's called a diminished shoulder, okay? That diminished shoulder allowed weight to be taken off the tenon, so it just rests on there, and then the tenon, of course, takes some of the weight, and that that shoulder takes a number of uh, a bunch of the weight too. Now later barns, but this is kind of a contradiction. That's I don't want to get involved in that too much. They were square shouldered, where actually the <coughs> pardon me, the top was squared off and then came down vertically instead of angled like that, and that's just called a square a square shoulder. And this is the barn, this is, we see the rafter system. There's basically three types of rafter systems, the German regular stool, which we will not see, a principal rafter system, which I don't think we'll see, and a common rafter system, meaning the rafters are all basically the same size. You go from end wall to end wall, they could be hewn, they could be, they could be milled. Many of the barns are pegged at their top ends after, before about, 1870 or 80, there could be exceptions to that. The, the stone wall here on the left, lower left hand corner is the rear wall and the upper tie holds, it holds or supports that cantilever, I'm sorry, the, the, canted, the canted timber which in turn holds up the purlin plate. And the purlin plate is the timber that runs the entire barn length, okay? Some of the barns, every once in a while, I was in a barn just a little bit ago, that actually had two purlins on each side of the, of the roof slope. Why would you have two purlins instead of just one? Anybody? Slate roof. I'm sorry? Slate roof. Not a bad, not a bad guess, but no. It's much bigger. It needs more support. It's just wider. So you need that much more support. The Canon Queen Post normally came in after about 1830. And that's other, a dating tool for these barns, okay? If it was straight up, it was a vertical Queen Post, that would most often, not always, most often indicate a date of before 1830. Not always. So there's these changes that come on. You don't have barns built like this anymore, but you did have barns built like that 200 years ago. 180 years ago. Everything is style. Everything changes. Everything evolves. Nothing stays the same except for change. This is an original wagon floor. Those are not boards. I'm looking back at a number of my, a number of my um, uh, descriptions of barns, my recordings of barns, and I said the floor, the floor boards, the floor boards. Well, they're not boards at all. Any, any board that's over an inch and a half thick. Is called a what? Anybody know? Plank. Yes. Plank. Yes, it's a plank. And many of these planks stretch from one end of the wagon bay to the other end. Okay? And also, very interesting, they're tapered. They're wider by one to three inches from one end to the other. Why would that be? Anybody? That'd be flat in the floor if you want to clean or no. It follows the contour of the tree. 
Oh, yeah. Follows the contour of the tree. Mm -hmm. So what do they have to do? Let's assume that all the plants on the wagon floor, they're original. Um, what did they what did they have to do? They were all tapered. Alternate, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Everybody hear that? They had to alternate them. They had to stagger them. Wide, narrow, wide, narrow, wide, narrow, wide, narrow. Like that. But this is a nice shot. I don't always get to take a picture of a, an original wagon floor that has no junk on it. <laughs> when you become a historian of the stuff, you hate junk. You know what kind of wood they use for the floors? Because I know like the most, very, the I don't know, most often, but very often, oak. It's very oh, strong. Yeah. They could have used hickory, but I don't know how common <coughs> hickory was. And they could have also used pine. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a hemlock, hemlock. Okay. So, there's one barn that was built in the Oli Valley that we had on a tour three years ago. 1787, and it had tulip wood wagon oh, floor. Okay. Tulip wood, and tulip wood. In Pennsylvania, I thought it was tulip, the tulip, yeah. Okay. Yeah, tulip wood is soft as butter. <clears throat> this is just a, a, a barn in Bedminster uh, Township, and the only reason I have an interest here in showing it to you is that there are five point stars on the rear wall, on the wall of the shed in the back, mm -hmm. and also the front wall, okay? Generally, five-pointed stars were not as old as six-pointed rosettes. Not always, but quite often, very often. Here is a barn with two eight-pointed stars. The most common star numbers, point, points on a star, is six, eight, twelve. Those are the most common. They're all even numbers. They're much more easy easily done geometrically when you have odd even numbers than when you have odd numbers. Seven pointed stars are very rare, but I've seen them. And what is seven? Is that, you know, seven is just almost a sacred number, basically, the number of days in a week and, and that kind of thing. It was, very, it was very strong biblically. I know a barn in southern Lehigh County and lower Milford that has two 14 point stars. And 14 is a very important number, too, actually. And there's all kinds of tradition behind that. But I know of only two barns that have 14-point stars. This is just another barn in Bucks County, a small one. It may even be a two-bay barn, where you only have a wagon bay and an end bay. Close-up of the star. So this is a 1880, 1890, 1900 barn that has a gamble roof. It has two roof slopes per side. You can see that there. Mm -hmm. uh, the inside of the barn, uh, Joyce, modern stable, stables for horses. Uh, horizontal, well, it's a horizontal longitudinal uh, summer beam. It's my, he helped me quite a lot. <laughs> he charged me a dime. <laughs> this, this is a, a, a pylorec type of stone formation in the middle of the wall. Sometimes that happens out in the far west in Pennsylvania, okay, the bank side of the barn. These are cut out uh, steps that lead up to the built-in ladder. Oh, yeah. You see that? And they come in different forms. Sometimes they're square, strictly square, strictly rectangular. Sometimes the, the rungs of the ladder go all the way down to the floor. So it varies quite a lot. These are round-headed na wire nails that reveal, well, I'm saying now that it's an 1890 to 1910 date of construction. Okay. This is a, anyone recognize that? A Washington State? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the tragedies, I took this picture eight or 10 or 12 years ago. I'm sure most of it's gone now. It's gone to barn heaven. But this is what we're doing. This is what we're experiencing and witnessing. We're just losing barns. Left, right, and center. Okay. This is the, the important thing about this is that the placement of the two doors on the end wall on the basement level are very much out of the right. Uh, location that you normally see. Usually these doors, the left one would be closer to the rear corner by about maybe two feet, and the other one, the other door with the hood on the right hand side would be pushed over maybe a foot or two to the front of the left door. So that's really unusual right there. What are English Lake District Corns? I'm going to go, uh, go through this really quick. That's an English Lake District Corn. It's the only it's only one of two four bay, two wagon bays and two end bays. Only one of two uh, 
English Lake District barns that have four bays, okay? This is the longest one known. It's in Springfield. I think it's in Springfield Township. We're darn near. But the, but the uh, English Lake District barn, it had origins in the Lake District in the northwest part of this, the country. And they were built in the 1700s. The earliest one that we know was 1769, but it was later ch a change. But the major change in this over standard barns is one, it has stone to the peak rather than frame. Uh, I'm sorry, to, to the eaves level. Okay, and it has a, instead of a recessed wall that creates the forebay, it has a pet roof. It has a pet roof across the whole, so, uh, across the whole length of the barn, and it, it, it's about four feet uh, out, and it protects all those stable wall doors. Okay, this is the other major type, actually style, I'm not gonna get into style versus type, style, <coughs> uh, two-level bank barn in PA, and they're most often in English um, areas. This is another one of about 1810 or 1820 or so, not far from the Delaware River, north of New Hope. Another one in Northern Bucks County. I want to show you this one. Okay, this is very interesting. Look at this bar. This is again, uh, it's around Spring, uh, Springfield Township. Everything is in Springfield Township. All right, you have, you have two pet roofs that used to be here. See that ledge right there? That's a water ledge. You had one in the front. So you had two that met each other, actually. And that's extremely rare. You hardly ever see that. But the pet roofs don't, uh, don't last. They wear out. They're exposed to the weather. They just run out. People are not going to fix them. And that's what happens. This is another barn up in that general area. Good barn. <coughs> You can see it under, underneath the uh, pent roof. This is the inside end of the, it's right here. This is the inside end of the pent roof arm, okay, that goes out. And of course, the stone wall there stabilizes that whole thing. And that is wedged in the top and the bottom. And this is the inside of the barn. You can't see the, the third one, but here, it is a pearl and plate, but it's staggered. I mentioned the, the pearl and plate name before. Pearl and plate, pearl and plate, and there's one in back of these other timbers right here, okay? But they're staggered. They don't enter into this principal rafter, I guess. I, so I was wrong, or I was right, I guess, about having that as an example. They enter the pearl and they enter the principal rafter at different heights. Okay, that's a rarity when a barn has a triple tier uh, pearl and plate system. Um, yeah, just another barn. This is the uh, Angel Moyer barn, uh, dated 1846. This door hood on the top, on the uh, second floor level, is very unusual. You don't normally see that. Now, this is another very odd thing. See, this is not stone to the peak, and it's not stone to the eaves level. So it goes to within about five, possibly six feet of the of the peak. Okay, we see that. I've seen that probably in 1850. Uh, 15, 18 barns or so in uh, the Bucks County area in the northern part. It's just one of those things that, that developed. I, I, I don't believe I've seen it in any other county, but that's possible. Here we have a barn that, you know, you look at it, this shed on the front, on the left side of the main stone part is, is, is just called a, a straw shed, and they were added most often to the main uh, section of the barns in the back, okay, increased crop storage area. They were called upcountry posted barns. But here we know what really happened when we look inside the barn. See, you have a stone wall on the upper floor level. That means that there is, that this is an English Lake District barn. And we don't see many of those where you have an English Lake District barn and you have a shed in the front. There's hundreds and hundreds of these barns in the Lehigh Valley and the, uh, in the Berks County area. Here's another barn, the Fatima place, and you can see the water ledge of the pent roof originally. Okay, here's another one. There's many of them in, uh, in English settled counties, meaning a lot of Bucks County, quite a bit to the southern half of Montgomery County, and a great deal of Chester County, and a good deal of Delaware County. Those were English settled counties. Now this is the second to the last slide, and the reason why this is so rare 
is because here you have a standard barn, okay, symmetrical roof line, and it's really been changed around a lot. It's not an original car. But here you have a bank, actually, right there. You can see it a little bit right there. I don't think I'm in anyone's way of it. Yeah. Um, you have a bank, a stone sidewall of the bank, okay? It enters or it starts right out here, and it goes up to a shed that leads into the forebay. There are actually a few of those in uh, Europe, okay? We have about, well, now we have only about four or five of them left in, uh, in PA. But it was just one of those things. Why did they build it that way instead of the normal way? I think it had to do with perhaps the, the limitation of, of not that many acreage. They wanted to place it near the road, and so it was just more convenient. And there's no reason why you couldn't do it. I thought all these barns were in Bucks County, and then when I was writing the book in about 2012 or 13, I came, along, I came across one in Chester County. There's always exceptions to every rule. So thank you everyone for coming here tonight, and be on the lookout for barns, or we are going to haunt you if you don't. <laughs> the deal. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you.